welcome everyone to the session 50 great uh, no, shades of retrospective your guide to continuous improvement of course we all do this by a uh, chris tone chris uh, is a, an enterprise agile coach uh, fostering uh, no, successful organizations through high performing teams so without any further delay i am just handing over to chris thank you sundari uh, pleasure to be here at agile india India has a very special place in my heart because I've actually been and visited the country. I was fortunate enough to travel to India uh, in 2019. I've been to Mumbai, New Delhi, uh, and Afghan National Park. I've never seen more people in my life because I, I visited during festival season and the pageantry and everything everyone had on and the excitement and passion people were showing was, was amazing. But I'm here to talk about continuous improvement. So anyone who doesn't know anything about me, I'm hugely passionate about continuous improvement and retrospectives in particular. You may hear that in my voice and you may notice sometimes I speak quite fast. So if I do speak a little bit fast, it's just because I'm excited, but I need you to tell me. So ping a message in the chat and just say, slow down and I will do my best to slow down. A little about a bit about me. Uh, I've been involved in agile ways of working for over ten years now, working with te with em enterprises and and teams from the smallest companies in the world to some of the largest ones. So, a wide range of, of experience there. And I'm most known for for, for retrospective. So I've shared some ninety four retrospective templates as of today. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the workplace being fun and exciting, and continuous improvement as a key part of that. I don't like just talking at people, so I want you to engage with me. And how you'll do that is we're going to be using Miro today. Let me share my screen so that everyone can follow along. If you click on that link I've just shared in the Zoom chat, you will be taken to our Miro board where you can interact with me today. There are no signups required, so it's freely accessible. If you just click that link, you'll be taken to a, a board and that's the way you can interact. If you prefer to do so, you can interact by typing in the, the Zoom chat or speaking aloud if you feel comfortable doing so. So I'm just going to pause for a few moments just to allow people time to get into that uh, Miro board. The link has just been shared, Madari, in the chat. I will paste it once more. Oh, sorry, I think it went to hosts and panelists. My mistake. There was a, a filter on my chat saying hosts and panelists. I've now shared with everyone. So it should come through to everyone now. For anyone who hasn't used Miro before, let's make sure that on the left hand side here, you've got this little blue cursor selected that will allow you to interact. Left click on any of these little objects will allow you to move them around. Double clicking on post it notes will allow you to type inside those post it notes. If you're seeing all of these cursors flying around the screen, collaborators cursors like I'm seeing right now, you can turn that off if it's a distraction. So just press this button here. Now, where I'd like you to start is a little bit of a, a little bit of an icebreaker. So using these little cute post-it note icons here, I would like you to drag them onto this scale. There's a number of duality lines here. If you feel retrospectives are magical experiences, drag a little post-it note to the right-hand side of the scale. If you feel they're thumbs-down experiences, put it on the left-hand side. Then, if you feel retrospectives are light bulb moments, they're, they're, they're great for ideas, then again, po put one of these post-it notes on the, the scale next to the light bulb. Uh, but also, if they're confusing in your eyes, yeah, this is, this is all about your own perspectives. And then lastly, retrospectives are either powerful experience or they're, they're frustrating. So starting with that, we'll use these duality lines to uh, gauge and temperature check the audience's experiences with retrospectives. Once you've shared your view there with these little post-its, uh, a little bit further below, there's a number of white post-it notes. What I'd like you to do is just put a single word, maybe a couple of words to describe what retrospectives mean to you. So these little post-it notes here, just type inside them. There we go. And of course, uh, for, for your awareness, I'm someone who likes to interact with the audience. So whilst I will allow time at the end for questions, if you have a question, don't hesitate to ask throughout. What we're going to do here is cover a number of my tips and tricks and strategies and agile hacks for enabling continuous improvement in the workplace. We have around about 45 minutes, so we'll cover as many as we can in the time frame. 
but you, the audience, will get to choose the direction of this talk. I could deliver this talk 50 times and every time would be different because it's all down to what the audience wants to hear about. So you will ma imagine those, those adventure books you read as a child where you would a character and you would be reading through and then at the end of that page it would say if you want to choose this direction turn to page 212 and you would get to page 212 and, and find out your character had suffered an injury or, or died and you'd be like oh, no i'm going to turn back to the previous page this talk is a bit like that you get to choose the direction so in general we're seeing that retrospectives are more magical uh, on the middle scale here, there's quite a mix, and the same with the bottom scale there. So the audience's per perspectives or, or experiences here have been a mixture of frustration, confusion, light bulb moments, powerful. And what about some of the words we're seeing? So it's about improvement, absolutely. It's about finding pain areas. It's about inspecting and adapting, of course. Uh, we could discover the reason for failures. We can... It can be a very powerful technique if you use well. It can be about helping a team discover and promote willingness to change. Finding out the 1% improvements, I like that. And there is a play that we're going to talk about in this, this talk today about 1% improvements, marginal gains. Valuable time, yes, absolutely. Okay, so we've got some different experiences from, from the audience here. What I want you to do now is help me choose the direction of this talk. The way you can do so is coming here on the board. Again, we'll use the little post-it notes to vote. This is a dot vote. You can hear first about the foundations for continuous improvements, facilitation styles and techniques, retrospective formats, or finishing up. And finishing up is that all important part at the end of the retro where you identify those actions, the things the team are gonna do differently to bring about change. So you can dot vote for those sections here by dragging them to the one you most want to hear about. Let me just make sure that these are all brought to the front because I think they might be hanging behind the back. Give that a go now. You get two votes each. Let's see what we're gonna come up with. The one, the section that gets the most votes is where we will start and we'll cover as many of these sections as we have time for. If anyone is struggling to access the link, just, just watch my, my shared screen and uh, you could choose to interact via the, the Zoom chat. By the look of things at the moment, we're looking at facilitation styles or facilitation approaches, taking the lead followed by finishing up. So another, another 15 seconds or so to get your votes in and then we're gonna start with facilitation styles. By the looks of it. Although it's looking close now, finishing up is, uh, is catching up here. Oh. Okay, I think finishing up, uh, sorry, citation styles first and then finishing up by the looks of it. So bringing your attention to here on the board now. Right, first question. How does silence feel during a retrospective? On the left-hand side of the scale here, you've got so uncomfortable. On the right-hand side of the scale, you've got this. It feels great. Again, vote with these poster notes. few early votes for uncomfortable. Yeah, it looks like the majority of people here are feeling uncomfortable when we face silence in retrospectives. Now, this is a play uh, all about silence and embracing silence. I will, I will admit to you folks, I'll be very honest and vulnerable with you. I was exactly the same in the past. I hated silence. When I heard silence in a retrospective and I was the facilitator, my, my most immediate thought was, oh, wow, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, I've asked the wrong question. Uh, maybe people are bored. Maybe they don't care. What am I doing wrong? And I've since learned that actually people process information in very different ways. I personally, I, I like to talk to think. I, I will talk out loud and I'm a, I'm a talker. And that's my preferred stance. Some people need to pause to reflect, take some time before responding. And that's okay, everyone is different. There is another few things I want to share with you. Um, silence can be your ally. It can be something you use to create 
great results in retrospectives, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, the FBI, famous for obviously interrogating people, they use silence to their advantage. What they do is they will ask a question and then they'll count in their heads. So someone, you know, the person will respond, they'll talk. And then when silence hits, they'll count in their head. They'll count to seven plus 10 seconds and they'll just wait. And the reason for that is, as you've observed, silence is uncomfortable and people want to fill that silence. And I felt it myself when when those thoughts began going through my head about silence and I was saying, oh, I've done something wrong here. My immediate thought was I need to fill that silence. I need to add another thought in. I need to ask another question and see if it results in change. Silence is your ally. So when, when, you're, when you're facing silence in a meeting, pause a moment, allow people the time to speak. Another person will probably add more context, add more detail, and we can use that silence. It can be, it can be a great ally for you. There is a technique that you can, know, uh, you can read a little bit more about it's called silent retrospectives. It was introduced to me, to me by a gentleman named Dov Sal. There is a YouTube video, uh, you can follow the link here. It's uh, on where it shows the three little pigs image on this board. If you click that link, you will be taken to the video and you can learn a little bit more about silence retrospectives. But essentially the way it works is you create a space a bit like this, a, a Miro board, a whiteboard of some kind. And the, the only rules are you can't speak. And the reason that can be powerful is because when you can't speak, you can't ask clarifying questions. You can't steer perhaps the direction of conversation towards your own, your own view. And you have to focus and, and the way you interact is you add another post-it with a question next to it just asking for a clarification it's a very different way of you of doing a retrospective and it can result in the team coming together a little bit further i will i've just jumped into the uh there we go the zoo the, the the youtube video has just been pasted into the chat there so yes if you haven't tried a silent retrospective i encourage you to do so if you feel uncomfortable during um, silent periods, I invite you to just pause a little bit longer than you think. Don't try and fill the silence with, with noise. We'll allow people the space to think and respond. Now, obviously, if every time you facilitate something, it's always quiet, that might be a sign of something wrong. But silence is not always a bad thing. Okay, moving on to the next play, fixing the format. Okay, now, this is probably going to be a surprise to some of you, given that I share well, almost 100 retro templates and I encourage creating new ones all the time. But sometimes fixing the format and staying with the same one over and over can be exactly what the team needs. The key outcome from a retrospective is improvements, actionable improvements. And if the team is using a consistent format, either start, stop, continue or sad, mad, glad or whatever format resonates with the team, and the end of the retro, there are actionable improvements, then the format doesn't matter. The format can actually be a distraction, okay? So what I tend to recommend here is if you're working with a team and the retro works for them, stick with it. If we start to struggle, we start to see uh, functions aren't coming out of it, people are disengaged, then invite the teams to experiment with something different, a different format. Working with a consistent format can help new teams establish the, the, the habits behind retrospection. So start, stop, continue can be great for just being simple and, and getting a team started. But the all important thing is the actions. Always ask the team how they prefer to proceed. Okay. The opposite of that is flexing the format. And this is the one that I'm most a fan of. So by flexing the format, what we do is we change it. We don't keep it the same every, every iteration, every sprint. We don't just do start, stop, continue, or sad, mad, glad, because sad, mad, glad makes me sad, mad, and glad. Oh, and not glad, sorry. So I have created personally 94 retro templates, all of which are freely accessible on my website. There are links to my websites later on in the talk, but here's just a few examples. So I created the Diwali theme retrospective, a retro for good over evil. I worked with, um, the, this drum master who is, who is um, from Indian descent, and we created this, this uh, Diwali-themed retrospective. I've also done a Diwali-themed agile game to introduce agility to a team. There's the dog meme retrospective. There's Squid Games, which was a very popular TV show. There was the cricket retrospective I shared recently. So rather than asking your team what went well in the last sprint, you could say, hey, what did we hit for six? Or 
what what bowled us out for a duck or how's that what do we need um an extra pair of eyes on where do we need some additional support there are so many ways of asking questions that provoke different answers so if if a team is being asked start stop continue every sprint what i have observed is that often the same things come up over and over because it's the same question whereas if you ask the question slightly differently if you build a format that resonates with the team that aligns to what they enjoy doing you can get very different answers so something i encourage you to do is flex the formats what you might do is rotate it every iteration you might choose a a format and use it for four iterations in a row and then try a new one there's lots of ways of doing it but by changing the format periodically what we do is we create an environment where new insights can be gained of course as i mentioned ask questions throughout this if you prefer to do so you can do so by uh, speaking in the zoom chat typing i know sundar is keeping an eye on the chat for me All right another another play i'm going to recommend to you the dealer's choice so again another question for you we are now here on the board how does it feel when you are in a meeting and one person calls out one by one for you to share so share progress of something how, do, how does that feel you can share your view by typing in these post-it notes all right we've got an oh my god Uneasy, yeah, something is wrong. You can feel like a blame game, yeah. So what I'm seeing here is a lot of negative responses. Forced interaction, you're being held on the spot. Okay, no, not me, don't choose me. Yes, absolutely. The thing is, this happens all the time. I call this status report syndrome. So what happens is a meeting is being scheduled, the facilitator, is trying to be inclusive. They're trying to make sure everyone has the opportunity to share. But the way they do so, they call out. They'll say, hey, Sandari, can you share your update? Or, hey, Mike, your turn now. And it can feel very one way because what happens is the person who shares then passes back to the facilitator. The facilitator then calls out the next person. So it can feel very much like a status report. It doesn't feel like a conversation. It doesn't feel like a shared meeting. So I call this status report syndrome. It happens in daily stand-ups. It happens in... In retrospectives, the intent is often good. We want to be inclusive, but at the same time, it can be uneasy, forced. It can feel less like a conversation. So something I recommend whenever I facilitate meetings is what concept I call the dealer's choice. So the last to speak nominates the next person to speak. So let's say we're in a daily stand-up right now, and I have been called out by the scrum, or I volunteered to speak first, and I've shared my, my plan for the day. What I would then do is choose the next person to speak. And what we do by doing this is we make it more like a conversation and we create a shared responsibility for the team ensuring everyone speaks rather than one person ensuring everyone speaks. So diversity, inclusivity becomes a collective responsibility rather than just the responsibility of the facilitator, but also can make it feel more conversational. Now, if I were in a physical room doing a stand up with a team, one way I might have got around this in the past would be we have an object. Um, I've got a mouse here, like you'd grab a random object and you'd throw that to the next person to say, hey, it's your turn now, whilst everyone's obviously standing up. We're, we're often working digitally now, so the dealer's choice is a, is a way around that. Nominate the next person to speak. You build a shared responsibility for facilitating group involvement, and you can make it feel more conversational rather than just a, a one-way interaction. Give that a go. Right, another thing to the format style, the facilitation styles. We've, we've talked about fixing the format. We've talked about flexing the format. Another one here is, excuse my language, fuck the format. Sometimes you don't need a format. Sometimes you don't need a template. You don't need something that's going to distract people. All that's needed is an open and honest conversation with the people involved what's the most important thing we need to improve? I'll share a bit of feedback with you here. I, I once shared a Home Alone themed retrospective. This is a, 
based on obviously the, the famous Christmas movie. And a scrum master used that retrospective with a few of their teams. One of them loved it. However, one person in another team said they didn't like it. It wasn't working for them. One of the prompts in that retro was keep the change, you filthy animal. And they responded this retro board. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that sometimes a format isn't needed. Maybe it's been a very tense few weeks. Maybe all that's needed is an open and honest conversation. And you can abandon the format and you can just say, hey, team, where do we most need to improve right now? What is causing us the most pain? And just have that conversation. Create the space where people can share their thoughts. And obviously, you're still trying to identify improvements. The format could be distracting in that respect. Okay. Another option you have is to flux the facilitator. So rotate the facilitator. I've got an image here of musical chairs. I'm interested, has anyone tried this before? Obviously what tends to happen is that retrospectives are facilitated by a scrum master or an agile coach. Has anyone tried rotating who facilitates a retrospective? Perhaps in that silence thing. Possibly not, possibly not. That's okay. The reason I recommend this is that each facilitator brings their own style, energy, st uh, stance of doing, of doing meetings. And by rotating who facilitates a meeting, what we actually do is we begin to build a capability, a uh, skill for facilitation into the team. So what this means is that uh, a scrum master or agile coach is less relied upon. Right? If, if, if they're on holiday, if they're unwell for a day, the team can still facilitate the meeting successfully. So how you can do this? Yeah, then, and I, I can see Abhay has shared, uh, they, they tried it, but they saw a few takers. How you can do this is you can ask volunteers, you can try and try and try the experiment and say, hey, what we'd like to do here is rotate who's doing the facilitator and everyone will get a go. And I, the facilitator or the traditional facilitator will provide you coaching and support in how to do so. Even though there are so many freely accessible templates around there nowadays, it's not like uh, that person has a lot of work and practice to do to create something. So their starting my point might be grabbing a template and try it. So the, the, again, the reason I encourage this is to build a collective responsibility for facilitation, to build the skill for facilitation into the team and reduce the reliance. But also it can refresh a team. As I said, a new person brings their own stance and energy. When I've done this in the past, I'll tell you a story. I was working with a team in South Africa and they used this technique, they rotated. And we had a Pokemon retrospective from, a, from one of the younger developers. We had a, a retrospective that was centered around the technical lead, Christopher Murray. So someone created a tech lead, Christopher Murray theme retrospective with some of his mannerisms and quotes. And it was just a very funny, enjoyable experience for those involved. So again, something you could try is rotating the facilitator. Here's a question for you folks. How much does a polar bear weigh? Anyone know? Right, this is very much a dad joke, but enough to break the ice is the answer. How much does a polar bear weigh? Enough to break the ice. It's a dad joke. It's, it's a, a dad joke to be an icebreaker. Now, icebreakers are used to learn more about people, your teams. They provoke, they, they can create a bit of a fun and enjoyment in the workplace. I'm a big fan of icebreakers because I think the problem is so often we work with teams and it's all work, 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 work. Now, work is important, but if it's all work, 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 then it can be very easy to forget that the people, the people part of our teams, our colleagues, are actually beating hearts behind their laptops. They are individuals of passions and interests. They, they enjoy different things. I have found that using icebreakers, I have learned more about my teams and the people I work with, and it's, it's built sense of community it's built a it's in, engendered trust it's helped our relationship grow there are so many ways you can do icebreakers uh, and again i'll tell you a story i once worked with a team in mexico 
means they were very, it was a very work, work focused culture. And I began introducing icebreakers. And one of the questions asked one day was, what was your favorite childhood video game? Now, from that question, what we learned was that two people from that same team who had worked together for over a year actually enjoyed the same type of video games. And the consequence of that question was that they both arranged that evening to play games together. So their relationship immediately strengthens based on asking a question that took less than five minutes of their day to answer. There are so many ways of building icebreakers into your meetings. I try to do them in as many as I can, but I always build them into my retrospective templates. A few examples here, I had people building tacos, you know, images of, of creating what, what a taco would be for them. I've, I've had, um, what's your, what, 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 what meme represents the last iteration? What's your favorite thing about Halloween? You can make it topical. You can make it about, again, the Diwali theme retrospective had share something you know about Diwali. There are so many ways of building icebreakers into the workplace, into how you work with your teams. And as a consequence, learning about them, which strengthens the relationship. And if you do that at the beginning of a retrospective, you can lighten the moves and, again, create the, the space, the environment for interaction, speaking up a safe environment where people feel more comfortable sharing things. Now, I'm conscious of time. We've got 15 minutes left. I know there were lots of votes for the other section, which was finishing up. I'm going to bring you to there and we'll share a few things around finishing up. Okay, so what I'm showing here is a concept called retroception. If anyone has seen the film Inception, that was all about a dream within a dream within a dream. What I'm suggesting here is build a retro within your retro. So we should be continuously improving how we continuously improve. We should be retrospecting on whether our retrospection, retrospectives add value at all. So there's ways you can do this. And I've, I've shared a few examples here. This was the Matrix movie retrospective. And at the bottom, what you've got is these little um, sentinel images. And it's simply a fist of five system. At the end of the retro, take a few minutes and ask the team, how was that retro for you on a scale of one to five? Right? And if it was a one, a retro took place, maybe some of the team was missing. We identified some improvements, but maybe we ran long of the time box. All the way to five, where everyone contributed without fear of judgment. So psychological safety was in place. We respected the time box. We identified functions with owners and we celebrated success as well as reflected on our challenges. So if we've done that at the end of a retro and we've seen that, well, actually the average score is a three, we could then be saying, okay, what should we try differently in the next retrospective to try and make it better? And that might be, well, something we spotted here was not everyone was speaking up. And we could ask the question, what is holding people back from speaking up? So we should be continuously improving the way we retro ourselves. There are so many ways you can do it. I, I've shared an image here of a gent called Steve Samson Jones. He, he had an image, or he was using a Harry Potter themed retrospective and he had some nice images that he drew to allow people to rate on a scale of one to five ones. But what I'm trying to, to, in, to reinforce here is that every meeting should be subject to continuous improvement, particularly retrospectives. So try and retrospect within your retrospectives. Someone mentioned marginal gains earlier, those 1% improvements. Is anyone familiar with the story of Sky Cycling, the team in the UK and what they did in 2003? Let me know in the chat if you are familiar with the story. Yes, okay, so basically what Sky did is they were one of the worst performing cycling teams they, a British cyclist had never won the Tour de France, one of the most famous cycling events throughout the world. So they were relatively unknown on the international scale for success. Now, they had a new technical director come in and what he did was say, right, we need to make improvements here, but we're not going to try and make huge improvements on, on certain areas. What we're looking for is a 1% improvement in lots of different areas. So they, they made a 1% improvement in the, the sleep quality the team got. They made a 1% improvement in the weight of um, a certain part of the bike. They made a 1% improvement in the way the team recovered in the, in the sports therapy they received after their events. They had a 1% improvement in a certain training technique. And all of those 1% improvements aggregated to make great results. The consequence of all of these small changes was that 
within, I think, five years, we had the British Tour de France winner. We had the British cycling team being one of the most successful at the time. So those small changes made great results. The reason this is in the finishing up section, because at the end of the retro, it can be difficult to get people to commit to, to actions. So one of the things I recommend you do at the end of a retro is just ask, OK, what would a 1% improvement in that look like? It's easier to commit to smaller changes than it is large. It's easier to complete smaller changes than it is large. There's a reason why Agile split things, splits things into smaller pieces, because we deliver smaller pieces more frequently, more iteratively. We get to learn from them and adjust accordingly. So the question I have for you here is just have a reflection point, have a think about how you could help your teams commit to smaller actions in your retrospectives. Add your thoughts on these post-it notes. Again, what I tend to do is ask that question, what would a 1% improvement look like? See someone's typing in, and it looks like they're saying, um, show how previous things have added value or how I've improved things. Absolutely. Let's show the successes of the past and the way of getting the team to commit small actions. Appreciate the small improvements, yeah, completely. Make them visible. If we don't make our improvements visible, they'll be forgotten about. So the, the absolute key thing people should do at the end of a retro is take those actions that agreed and put them somewhere visible. Add them to your backlog. Make them be prioritized alongside other things. Someone said Kaizen here. Kaizen here is the, uh, the Japanese term, not for continuous improvement. That's... Um, uh, mistranslation. The actual translation is make uh, make change make, make change for the better. Make change for the better. I've been told. So kaizen is about make change for the better. Small improvements. And the thing about kaizen is it happens everywhere with everybody and all the time. So it doesn't matter what it is. You can make small improvements to everything, and everyone is responsible for it. Yes, you can share success stories. You can show metrics of previous things. And if you see an action that's big. Break it down completely. One, one, one qualifying question I like to ask is, if you've got an action on a retrospective, you could ask, is that achievable in the next few weeks? And if it's not, can we make it smaller? Can we reduce the scope of it? Can we make it a bit more incremental? Okay. Here's a question for you. Has anyone recognized this behavior? Action avoidance. Yeah, you, you, you ask a question, who wants to change? And everyone puts their hand up. And then who wants a change? Silence. No one puts their hand up. No one volunteers. Does anyone recognize that? We've we seen this before. Can you still hear me, folks? Yeah, so I love it. Okay, so I saw someone say lost audio. So who wants a change? Everyone wants it, but nobody wants to do it. One of the questions I ask all the time when I see this, when I'm working with teams and I see a reluctance to do retrospectives or I see a reluctance to take on actions, is I remind them that, that taking no action is a decision. So if a team is aware that something isn't right, something needs improvements and they do nothing about it, that is a decision. You are deciding not to do anything about it and you are aware that in the future, same thing will happen. So taking no action is in itself a decision. Einstein's definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over and expecting different results. So if a team is reluctant to commit to action, odds are they'll be frustrated about the same things next time you do a retrospective. So if you've got a team that are reluctant to commit to actions, obviously there's lots of approaches you can try. We've, we've talked about making things smaller. It's easy to commit something that's smaller. It doesn't feel as dangerous and scary. But also just remind them that if you're taking no action, that's a decision. We are collectively aware that that is a decision and that nothing will change. Give that a go. Use that as a, a response. Now, 
we we've we've seen dot voting uh in our uh in in this session today i've i've had you using little post-it notes to vote on the most important areas to you when it comes to the end of a retrospective and in fact during retrospectives that i facilitate the way i do it is i use creative consensus so i i build um, the team's responsibility to vote on the most important thing to them so let's imagine a retrospective in fact i'll take you back to the diwali theme retrospective because i think that one's uh may well resonate with you folks. So if I was facilitating this retrospective right now, I would ask the team, which prompt would you like to start with? Okay. So let's say the team started with lights or DS. What's guiding our path? What's our vision for the next iteration? All right. People would then respond on these post-it notes. We'd focus on just this one. They would respond on the post-it notes. And then once the timer has run out, and I tend to allow three to five minutes for this, I would ask the team to vote on the most important thing for them. What is most guiding our path? What is most like our vision for the next iteration? So I'd get a consensus view. And from that single thing, I would ask the team to create an action. Now, by doing this, what I avoid is a situation where you do a retrospective and you talk about all the possible things that you could improve, about, improve upon, and you wait right till the end to capture retrospective actions, and then you run out of time. By doing it in this way, what we're doing is we are collecting actions iteratively, but we are allowing the team, you know, the team that are affected by, by these changes to decide on the most important thing to them first. And from that, we pull an action. Now, the beauty of modern tools we have available to us, whiteboards and otherwise, is you don't just have to use dots to vote. You could use tiny Freddie Mercury's to vote. You could use little images of post-it notes. You could choose whatever you want whatever you want, and you could allow and trust the team to decide on the most important area to address in their eyes. So try creative dot voting. Okay, we're going to cover one more tip, and then I'm just going to do a sense check. I'm sure I think we're running out of time. Do a quick temperature check. I'm going to get a bit of feedback from you from yourselves, and I'm going to point you towards some more resources that where you that you might find useful uh, in your quest for continuous improvement. So what makes an action actionable? Any thoughts here? How do you make sure that something is in a ready state for it to be worked on? Add your thoughts on these post-it notes. An owner, yes, absolutely. We need to know who is working on it. We need to know when it's going to be done by. Yeah, creating stories and tasks or add, yeah, adding things to your backlog, so making it visible. When, what, when, how, yeah, a verb, so we know it's, it's something being done, it's defined. So many people will be familiar with the concept of SMART goals. So SMART goals are specific, so we know exactly what it is. They're measurable, we know how we'll know when it's done. Uh, they're achievable, it's realistic, it's actually something within our power to do something about. It's realistic, so we can achieve it. It's, it's something that we can be done. And lastly, there's a time element to it. We know when we want to accomplish it by. So again, something that I, I see a lot of teams struggle with is turning those discussions, those insights in retrospectives into actionable goal, actionable things. So a few points I try to recommend here. We can sure that at the end of a retro, the items you discuss are on the backlog and they're visible. They're ideally prioritized alongside other work. They are owned by someone or, or you've got a concept of who's going to be working on it. Uh, we know that it's something that the team can actually do something about. And uh, it's got a time element to it. We know when we want to achieve it by. So, yes, give that a go. OK, uh, launch of time, folks. It would be very poor form of me to be talking about retrospectives without building in a retrospective into this workshop. So what I'd like you to do is using these post-it notes here, Drag a post-it note onto this scale to the right here. In the left-hand corner, it says, this was the worst ever use of my time. In the top right-hand corner, this was the best ever use of my time, and three is somewhere in the middle. If you can drag a post-it note there and add any comments, any words that would help me with continuously improving how I run this workshop, that would be really helpful. I am very thick-skinned, so if there's anything you didn't like, do fair with me. It will help me to continuously improve how I deliver workshops myself. All feedback is welcome and appreciated.
And then once we've taken just a few moments to add your thoughts, I will open the floor to any questions. I will be going into the Hangouts area afterwards, so you can have a chat with me if you have any further questions, by the way. So do jump onto there. And uh, yeah, once you've finished adding any more thoughts, I will point you towards some more resources you might find useful on the continuous improvement side of things. Common thing I do, one bit of uh, feedback I do receive about this particular workshop is that uh, people would like more time uh, and it can feel a bit compressed. So my, my intent is always to cover as much as we can in the time frame, but it's such a broad topic. And of course, there are time boxes. So I do give these talks uh, on, on a relatively regular basis. Uh, so look out for uh, more of them uh, from me. If you follow me on LinkedIn or, or go to my website, you'll be able to see uh, when I'm next giving these talks. And then all, all of my information, all of my templates are freely accessible. All my information I share is not behind a paywall. Okay, thank you for your feedback, folks. I'm just going to bring your attention down to here. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, just click this link here on the left-hand side. You can connect with me. I share all my retros, all my advice and guidance around continuous improvement there. I do have a book that's that's coming out in a few months' time. It's all about retrospectives and continuous improvement. And if you'd like to pre-order a copy, feel free to do so. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. There's another 1,800 people on there. Again, I share tips and advice and guidance. I have a podcast that goes on there as well with some, some huge names in the Agile space. And my website here as well, where you can explore all my retro templates, download them, access them for free. If you have a tool like Miro, Mural, Google Jamboards, uh, Lucid Spark, you can use my templates free of charge. It isn't required for you to sign up or provide an email when using my website, but obviously if you'd like to do so, you are welcome. So all freely accessible information. And I think we are out of time. So if there are any final questions, do feel free to ask. Uh, and I will be jumping into the Hangout space in a moment to chat further. Let me share a few links with you so you can see them. Uh, just a couple of more minutes, uh, Chris. Like, I think there is a question. Can we use your template in Trello? In Trello? Uh, so you can't, what you can't do is use the image side of things in Trello. But what you could do is you could open um, one of my templates. You could create columns in Trello it's aligned with some of the prompts that I use, and you could do it in that way. Trello uh, restricts, unfortunately, certain things. I think uh, people can use the YouTube uh, also to understand what are the different things, maybe. Right? I'm just sharing my links in the chat. So you can see the link, the LinkedIn, uh, Virtual Lab Approach for Code UK is my website, my YouTube, and my podcast. Thanks, Chris. It was a wonderful session. I think many of us will be having uh, you know, interesting retro going forward with our teams. Mm -hmm.